Welcome to the People Data for Good podcast with Al Adamson. Hi, welcome back to the People Data for Good podcast. I am very excited to be with Brian Hershey of Gloat and Ian Cook of Vizier. Gentlemen, how are you two doing? Doing pretty well. Thanks. Thanks for having us, Al. Yeah, doing hey. good, Al. Thanks. I mean, there's so much happening in the HR tech market, uh, particularly as we are, and I do not know if many will agree with this, exiting COVID or the, the, the pandemic. Certainly there's a return to workplace, a return to normalcy. However, we're never going to be back to what we were and nor should we because many aspects of the work experience was uh, about to break, uh, namely burnout, namely really understanding the constraints that were being put on people's lives if they have young kids and elder care. And that's really driven this notion around well-being and creating strategies that are humanizing the corporate experience. So I'm excited to explore this theme and the solutions that you bring to the market. So Brian, if you would introduce yourself and a little bit about GLOAT. Absolutely. Thanks, Al. Uh, Brian Hershey, I'm the head of enterprise strategy at Gloat. And uh, Al, I just have to, you know, I have to say, you know, just to echo, you know, your, your introduction there, I think this is really just such an, you know, exciting time to be in the HR space and in particular in the HR technology space. It's been an incredibly dynamic year and an exciting year. And I just, you know, I feel so grateful to, to be a part of this. Um, and I think it's 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 you know it's it's only going to be you know more exciting in, in the year to come as as the landscape continues to evolve. Um, and uh, yeah, I look forward to telling you a little bit about the role that that Gloat has has to play in that evolving landscape. Um, so Gloat is an AI powered talent marketplace. We're really the pioneering vendor behind this concept of an internal talent marketplace. Something that we mm -hmm. built uh, years ago, you know, for the first time with enterprise design partners, Unilever and later Schneider Electric. And from the ground up, we kind of you know, re-looked at the way that you know, large organizations can utilize talent um, and the way that they could empower their employees to navigate careers. And if we really boil it down to kind of the fundamental concept, what we saw was that the way that organizations are utilizing talent is sort of sort of stuck in this hundred years old paradigm of people in boxes, right? Mm -hmm. We have sort of predefined roles with predefined sets of skills and predefined remit to only do a certain type of work in a certain place of the business. Mm -hmm. And we kind of looked at this and, and thought that this is actually holding, holding back large companies in a really meaningful way and holding people back in a really big mm -hmm. way. And so we kind of said, we think there's no reason why large enterprises can't be just as agile as small startups, but in order for that to happen, we need to think about taking people outside of boxes once and for all, and sort of you know looking at the world not in, in, in sort of the language of job titles and, and hierarchies and these sort of rigid you know bureaucratic you know career paths, but in a much more agile skill and work based uh, sort of approach, and that's what we've done with the internal talent marketplace. So it's a, a really a replatforming of talent in a company, and it's, it's something that allows employees to find work opportunities, whether it's a project, a gig, a full-time role, a volunteering experience, a mentor uh, across the organization, you know, in a way that aligns to their skills, but also to their interests and aspirations. So really a win-win, allowing large enterprises to become more agile allowing people to navigate more fulfilling careers, which is you know, the impact that, that we're really, really proud of. Well, Brian, as you're sharing, I'm just you know, smiling because it's, uh, so I'm hearing that you're appreciating people as dynamic, evolving, sapient human beings, <laughs> as, as opposed to these fixed things that are moved, you know, interchangeable and moved around at, at will. So, you know, again, appreciate what you do. And, and obviously you appreciate what Gloat does and you augment that insight and, and approach uh, with what Vizier does. Can you speak to that a bit? Yeah, I, I can. Absolutely, Alan. And thanks for having us on. As always, I appreciate being part of your drive on people data for good. Um, so Vizier, our mission is to make people analytics simple. Like people are complex and, and all of the joy that comes with that sentence is complex. Uh, our perspective is that as a business is that the, the analysis of that, the use of that data to help move your business forward shouldn't be. And so what we do as an organization is 
look at the key business questions that are common around people and who's staying, who's leaving. Mobility is a huge one. Diversity is a huge one. Hopefully people are aware of you know, some of the impacts that Vizier data has had in those places. Mm -hmm. And then we design analytic models so that an organization doesn't need to. They can go from raw data from multiple different systems in, in just all of that into Vizier so that they can get their answers. So you know, our, our real position in the world is to, to help organize all of the people data that's flying around in all of these systems, all of the great new technologies that are evolving to help solve powerful problems and allowing the, the, the so that questions, like we support mobility so that diversity improves, so that retention improves. Mm. Uh, and so that's, that's where we sit, that's what we're passionate about. Um, and, and that's also, you know, as we get into it, that's what we, where we recognize partnerships with people like Gloat and, and engagements with the talent marketplace, which I think is one of the most exciting things to accelerate out of 2020 is, is, is worth exploring and kind of worth explaining how all that goes together. Yeah, and as we talk about the future of work, I think both of you are hitting on some key elements that used to be nice to have, and now they're absolutely essential. Number one, understand the current state of and where people are, what they're doing, what they're not doing, and also helping them grow and evolve over time. I don't have to tell you too, and our listeners I'm sure would agree, that one of the key drivers of disengagement or low engagement is the fact that they're not being seen, they're not being heard, they're not being empowered, they don't have the career development opportunities. And oftentimes, oh gosh, we need to build capability in this organization, let's hire somebody as opposed to look internally and see who's most appropriate, who's promotion ready, who's willing and able to move. So can you, Brian, explain, elaborate a bit on what a internal talent marketplace looks like to you and Globe? Absolutely. Yeah. So I, I think you, you hit the nail on the head. And, you know, when, when we started to you know, speak to enterprises and you know, begin to try to understand the challenges that you know they're all facing. You know, we heard a lot of the same things you know, from different areas of HR, right? We need to reskill and upskill and future-proof the workforce. We need to reduce time to hire. We need to develop our employees. Uh, we need to uh, you know, create more fulfilling you know, experiences for our employees. We need to reduce employee turnover. You know, all these different, you know, very important objectives from different areas of HR. And we kind of took a step back and, and we realized that, you know, all of these, you know, different problems we're trying to solve are, are sort of telling us the same story. And that's that, you know, HR teams around the world today and you know, businesses are, are in a race to, you know, align their talent to the needs of the business. And things are changing so fast now that, you know, the, the, the pressure is really on for HR to be able to meet the needs of the business with talent at speed. And so when mm -hmm. we think about, you know, the, the role the talent marketplace has to play there, it's really helping you, you know, say, you know, you don't have time or, or you know, infinitely scalable resources, as you said, to go out and hire somebody every time there's a need somewhere in the business. Mm -hmm. And so if we look at our, you know, talent as an organizational pool of skills and capacity, we can, you know, suddenly, you know, realize we can, we can, you know, do so much more than we thought we could with the talent we already have. Um, mm -hmm. And in doing that and in fully utilizing the talent that we have and bringing a skill we didn't even know about that's, you know, with an employee, you know, trapped somewhere in the business, we can, we can actually bring that skill to where it's needed and put it to work. Really, really, really powerful. And at the same time, of course, you know, giving employees the opportunity to feel, utilized, you know, feel, feel fulfilled and, and, and feel you know, engaged at work. We actually did a really interesting survey, which you know, confirms you know, some of the points you mentioned. We, 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 we called this survey the Why We Work survey, and we, you know, we went and spoke to about 1,000 employees and asked sort of, you know, what are some of the reasons why you, know, you might actually leave your employer? And you know, no surprise you know, you know, to us and you know, probably to many of our audience, you know, above compensation, the number, the number one and the number two things were lack of you know, visibility on growth opportunities. And the second one was simply kind of getting bored and wanting to try something new. I think it's just intrinsic to human beings, especially to you know, the millennial generation, you know, of which you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a, a proud member. We, we, want, you know, we want to experiment, we want to try new things. Um, we want to you know, move you know, forward or sideways in our career you know, faster than ever before. Um, and that's, that's, I think, really what the talent marketplace uh, is enabling. And, 
the last year has you know sort of taught us anything it's that you know we're, we're entering you know a, a state when you know this type of flexibility i think is going to be you know the new norm yeah I, I, the flexibility and agility in you got some just, comments on that just want to pile in on what brian is saying kind of more anecdotally and kind of why i think this is important like way early in my career i did a lot of uh, experience-based learning so you know two or three days out in the wilds um living in cabins and you know running canoes and things like that and you spend a lot of time sitting around a campfire and i'm sitting around a campfire with executives from sony and McK uh, mckinsey and people like that what struck me in those conversations that when you you got under the skin of all of those people they had so much more talent than their job title it was, it was actually fascinating the things that they were truly passionate about the, the things they were gifted in way beyond their job title and, and what I see, and I, you know, I think that's common in many people, and what I see in the talent marketplace is, is an ability to access that and express that and unleash that. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I, I love the way Brian X describes it, and it kind of, it, it goes right back to this very human experience that drove a lot of, whilst I work in analytics, I do so from a, a kind of appreciation of the person that it just, it just kind of triggered that story. It's like, people are so much more than their job title, and I think that's a really important piece that that kind of comes from gloat and comes from what they they allow you to unleash yeah I, I love what you both are saying i have long talked about the need for us as human beings after the basics uh that we need to be seen we need to be heard and we need to be empowered and you know not to be seen for not only who we are and who what we've done but where we want to go and also heard you know if we have ideas if we have aspirations you know who, who's going to hear us both individually and systematically and the idea when we talk about feedback being told what to do I, I don't know many knowledge workers with any muster who want to be told what to do day in and day out but truly facilitated coached help to get to a better place and so i say that with with a framing because when we talk about skills, when we talk about um, aspirations, uh, you know, what is the data? You know, what are we capturing? Where does it come from? So, you know, going back to you, Brian, you know, what does skill ta taxonomy look like? You know, how what data are you capturing? That's 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 a great, I think, place to 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 start this conversation, and and you know, we can talk about you know how the data flows. Um, you know, it's 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 interesting. You know, we have thought about you know I think employee data and, and you know, work data for a long time is this very kind of top down thing, right? We need to go and buy a you know skills taxonomy that has every you know every skill ever recorded on earth, and we maybe need to you know buy a job architecture, and we need to almost like put put labels on onto you know all of these boxes and 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 try to you know almost inform our employees. Okay, you're a product manager. Therefore, you you know you have these ten skills, right? Mm -hmm. We know that that's not the way it works. Uh, we you know to to, to Ian's point, um, people have all kinds of experiences and diverse backgrounds, and, and and can bring so much more to the table than what their job title might suggest. Mm -hmm. So, from a gloat perspective, we really wanted to focus on capturing that bottom up view, and 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 how we built gloat and how we thought about it was we really want it to be a platform where employees can tell the business what they can do and not the other way around. No. Uh, and and that's, that's when we learn really kind of what we have, our true kind of inventory and visibility on the skills that exist within the organization. The second piece, as you mentioned, you know, beyond, beyond skills. And again, when we, when we think about skills, we don't, we don't want to limit this in any way, right? So every organization is incredibly unique. We want to make sure that our skills engine that is powering you know our talent marketplace is speaking the language of the organization that we're working with so as employees are telling us what their skills are in their you know unique language as managers are describing projects uploading you know job descriptions we're learning that language and the relationships between those entities that you know might be very unique to your company so for example a product manager in one company might have different skills and capabilities and interact with different stakeholders and maybe even you know take different career paths in one organization than in another and so we've built our technology to to accommodate for that which is which is really important and then the other piece which is even more important than the skills piece is the aspirations piece which which you touched on and you know when we think about the data here we actually realize it's not only 
sort of the right thing to do, right? We, we want to make an, you know, a solution that's centered around the employee, but it's the only way to do it. Um, mm -hmm. And we found this out early on when building an internal talent marketplace, because we realized that we can have you know, a, a place where we have, let's say, you know, an accountant who you know, tells us you know, they have lots of great you know, accounting skills, and we can match that accountant with accounting projects and accounting roles and accounting mentors all day long. But if that individual is not interested in doing more accounting work, and deep down, they want to become you know, a member of the strategic finance team, and there are certain you know, additional skills and experiences that they would like to gain, if we're not matching based on that forward-looking view, we're never going to get the buy-in from the individual. We're never going to get anyone to raise their hand to actually participate in this marketplace, right? So in order to create that sort of liquidity between opportunity and skills and capacity, it has to be centered around individual purpose. Um, and so in our platform, when you, when you come and you build sort of your profile, a, a really big part of that is telling us exactly where you want to go, what roles you're aspiring to, what skills you'd like to develop, what experiences you'd like to have on a go-forward basis. And those are actually the most really powerful attributes that we can use to help create that alignment and, and sort of liquidity in the marketplace. Yes, I mean, your narrative is inspiring and right on. Because uh, people don't want to be told, again, what to do. And if it's lining up with where they want to go, then to your point, the energy and enthusiasm to engage in a process, whether it be a learning process or a business process will be heightened you know, exponentially. So I mean, that's fantastic. Ian, yeah, what's your reaction to what Brian just shared? And how does Vizier augment that? Yeah, so a, a, a couple of things on the Vizier side, like, um, and I'll probably start with a customer story as to where I think this this super components tie in. Like we've had a number of customers looking at diversity and and not just general representation, but really kind of at depth. And, and several of them identified that actually, whilst they were on a majority level diverse, they didn't have mobility for those populations up through the business. Mm. And so you know, kudos to these people Alex team, they've been using that data to just literally bang on their different executives saying like, divert, and it goes back to something Brian said, like diversity is not about hiring from the outside, it's actually about growing from the inside. And so that, that's a, a, it's a clear and complex problem that you can go the sort of the Henry Ford route of like, well, let's manage all the boxes. And, and I know mm -hmm. that fails under its own weight. Like there's, there's a reason why succession pools would only ever be managed for the top 300 because the notion of the amount of effort a person would have to put in to do that well for 30,000 is, is just unimaginable. And whereas technology that we now have, the way we can process it can kind of unleash that. So Vizier kind of plays two roles. First of all, you know, the, the analysis of the dynamics and the population that, that our clients are doing is raising and highlighting the need for the kind of that unleashing of the mobility it, it hits so many factors mm -hmm. be it retention be it diversity be it you know staying competitive in a crazy job market be it uh, adjusting your business model and, and adjusting the skills in your business model to, to to move you know we all know it's better to transfer somebody internally to than, than fire and rehire like we that I think it's pretty well understood that that's a like the fire and rehire is a slow and risky approach to morphing your business. The, uh, the ch grow within is um, again fairly well established as for the most part the better out. So our, our clients are finding that. And then you've got the flip side is like, okay, so we've made this investment, we've got this strategy running. So so what is it doing for us? Which which is where that the, the, what I call the so that, like we create mobility so that we improve diversity. Well, is that happening? We create mobility so that retention is improved in these areas. Is that happening? And so that's the, the secondary piece of, of Vizier, which is simplifying across all these uh, fantastically complex pieces of technology like Gloat so that you can see the strategy we're pursuing is working. Talent acquisition uh, is a classic place for buying a piece of technology, thinking it's going to change the outcome, and then having no idea whether it does or doesn't. And mm. I, I don't advocate for that as a way to buy technology <laughs> at all. Whereas if you're running a program and you're trying to change an outcome from your business, technology is a brilliant enabler. 
and you need to track through like is it working is it changing how is that changing um, um, yeah i'll pause there because i could go on and on as you know but i will pause yeah. <laughs> hey, as you're talking as you're both talking uh, the book by christopher zook comes to mind i mean it, probably 20 years old and it, his, he's written several books but the one i'm thinking of is profit from the core um it talks about you know knowing your customers and getting value from your customers uh versus going out with new customer acquisition all the time and looking at adjacent and helping them evolve and citing American Express and their customer segmentation. I'm thinking about how Gloat and Vizier actually help leaders understand their workforce as like internal customer groups and segment and give them unique experiences over time. So you can improve diversity, not only in hiring numbers, but to your earlier point, promotion numbers, retention numbers, you know, feelings of inclusion and belonging, you know, things like that, that we all aspire to where I want to toggle a little bit and this is just a little bit is if I'm a listener and I'm a HR practitioner people analytics leader an executive inside or outside of HR I'm thinking okay this all makes sense and I am thinking well we're either doing that already and uh, question mark <laughs> or uh, quote unquote we're not there yet and I'm sure you hear that, you know, all the time. And it's my position, so I'm not going to uh, have you sell yourselves. It's my position that whether you be an HR executive or a people analytics leader or someone who is a COE lead, is that we have to be more open to leveraging technology and analytics to stand up and improve processes and experiences over time. And that means we have to be educated buyers. So what I want to ask you first, Brian, is yeah, how, what is the value proposition with going with a gloat or you know, other solution provider? I mean, it's why do you think many organizations are kind of stuck and not making this very necessary step to automate these processes? Absolutely. That, I think that's a great, great direction to take the conversation. Um, you know, maybe I'll, you know, I'll, I'll start by kind of addressing, you know, the, the, the first piece of this, which is, you know, how, how does an HR leader or, 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 or another business leader, you know, think about almost getting started with something like this? Like, are, are you ready for this? Um, and I think the really, you know, nice thing about, you know, really anything people analytics oriented or, you know, even you know, talent marketplace oriented is you can always start somewhere. And actually the way we always do this is in an iterative approach. I think it's, it's, it's the way that we can you know, do something, right? It doesn't, we don't have to tra transform the entire business overnight. We know that that's not, not always gonna be, you know, the culture is not maybe gonna be set up you know, to do that or it's just not, not practical, but we can start somewhere and then we can prove value, right? And that's where measuring that value comes in and where the, you know, the data piece comes in. And then we can make you know, data informed, intelligent decisions about you know, how to continue to roll out, continue to expand and, and you know, continue to drive impact. And ultimately, I think what you know, HR in general, I think is a challenge and, and something that is, is also really the language around it is changing because you know, HR kind of traditionally was sort of viewed as a support function, right? It's, 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 it's a cost center. And so, mm -hmm. When you think about you know needing to implement new solutions or you know impact, it's always sort of you know okay you know the bare the bare minimum or or what's the impact on the business? You know it's hard to get budget and, and all these things. But now we're coming into an era where HR is you know hands down you know becoming the most strategic function in any business, right? It's it's a matter of business survival to have the talent that you need to retain the talent that you need. And so, you know, now, you know, HR needs to, you know, speak this language where they can go to the business stakeholders and prove value, right? And so how do you, how do you actually do that? Well, it's, it's, it's not easy um, because there's a lot of data involved. It lives in a lot of different places. And so we, when, when we bring a talent marketplace to life in a company, for example, you know, we're trying to answer really interesting questions like, you know, how have, you know, mentorship relationships impacted employee engagement or employee career progression or employee turnover? Um, how has participation in the talent marketplace in one geography 
you know, been different on employee retention versus, you know, another geography and all these really interesting questions where we can demonstrate a lot of value to the business. I mean, on the order of you know, millions and millions of dollars of, of, of ROI, but they're hard questions to answer because that data lives in a lot of different places. And so where I think, you know, a, a tool like Glode and, and a tool like Vizier, you know, play so beautifully together is, you know, we, we have Glode, which is, you know, a platform that, that, that is allowing companies to take all this amazing action and, you know, you know, great create agile projects and, and succession plans and all, all this great stuff that we know is driving impact. But then you can go to Vizier, you can visualize that, you can bring in data from you know around the organization, prove that value, strategize, and then kind of iterate and and, and you know prove to the business the value and, and keep going. So I guess I guess the advice is you know we, every every organization we speak to um, you know tends to say not sure if we're ready if you're, you know, the data driven approach for the agile enterprise for, you know, for all these different pieces. But the good news is, you know, you, you can get started and, and it's really on HR to kind of spark this change and really own this kind of new posture in the business as, you know, a strategic kind of force. Um, and, you know, we're, I think actually helping a lot of organizations, uh, HR teams that we work with kind of realize that and, and achieve that and, and, you know, see great, great success with that. Outstanding. Ian, your thoughts on? You know, I was just going to just really double in on, on something that Brian's saying. I think a lot of HR leadership when it comes to technology have, have kind of been burned a little by the whole transactional system wave. Yep. So most people's assumption is that when I buy a new piece of technology, it's a multi-year, multi-million, third party, you know, I got to get it all right. Massive, massive lift. Because that's been their experience to date. Like yeah. I know Burson recently launched some research around um, we've been through this massive wave of transactional system replacement. It was costly, it was painful, lots of people lost hair and sleep, and yet the results of it are not what people wanted. So there's this little bit of, of hesitancy from their experience on the transactional system world. Well, the new technologies, the, the technologies of you know Gloat, Vizier, and, and the others, we don't work that way. Like Deployments can take six weeks. Deployments are iterative. You can start on a business unit. You can start on a specific data set. You can run it up. You can use it. You can use it in a constrained way. And then it grows with you. And so I think that's one of the, the big kind of misperceptions or kind of assumed pain points that, that cause people to hold. It's like, I've just caught my breath after the transactional system build. Right. It's like, I'm not going to go into that pain again. Like, why right. would I choose to do that? And it's like, actually, that this isn't painful. Um, yeah. And, you know, Gloat have their examples from their clients. We've got examples from ours where from contract signing to using the data to make a decision is six, eight, 10, 12 weeks. Now, there's an element of, of motivation on both sides of that, but that's not the 12-year, multi-million dollar projects that people have been walking through. So I think that's a really important piece to, to understand is, these applications are, we've learned so much, technology has moved so far that, that those deploy, use and build is, is far more uh, kind of common in the kind of analytics effectiveness oriented applications than it is in the large kind of record keeping efficiency transactional ones. Mm -hmm. And that, that is a, that is that misperception kind of holds people back. Because um, uh, the, other, the other pieces I think it's often important to look at indecision against the flip side. It's like, yeah. oh, well, you know, I haven't used data so far. I don't know if I need to use it. It's like, well, everybody else is. And if you're not making a decision with data, you're guessing. Like, are you, are you really happy with guessing in the 21st century? Um, yeah. And then the, the second part of that is that you only start learning by doing it. There, there is no way to kind of learn your way to success and then do it. So you kind of just have to get started. Um, yeah, th thank you for that. Uh, the um, question that I'm going to ask now is both simple and complicated. It, it, and it's really who's your buyer and who's your consumer at the end of the day. And let me explain and create some context because 
even before COVID, I and many other people much smarter than me were jumping up and down saying, we, knew, we need new management models. We have these functions that are highly siloed, yet when we move into the future of work, digital transformation is affecting HR strategy, recruitment strategy, internal development strategy. We have facilities over here. We have legal. We have GDPR and, and privacy. We have all this stuff that is affecting how work gets done. Not to mention outsourcing, automation, gig economy, all that stuff. And there's many, been many organizations like, okay, it's too complex. We're just going to go with the inertia of history and we'll stay in this functional place. COVID, however, lit a big fire under people's tail. And no, you know, facilities now is, you know, arm in arm with HR, which is arm in arm with operations and digital transformation and, and all this. So now we have almost forced into this new governance model around talent strategies, around work strategy more broadly. And so what I heard you say earlier, Brian, is that you're actually helping some clients you know, do this better and stay at, at, at the forefront. Um, um, HR specifically. So in those cases where organizations are using your tools in the way that's ideal or close to ideal, what are the unique attributes? Like going back, who is the buyer? What's the governance model around it? Who's consuming it? You know, I assume it's you know meant to inform strategy, but what type of strategies at what frequency? You know, so again, simple question. But I'm sure with a lot of underlying, you know, complexity. Yeah, they're they're. That's Good luck beautiful. with that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, no, it's it's a it's a really really interesting question, and, and it's it's very relevant because there's sort of this um, I think you know idea that you know only the most forward looking advanced you know the Unilevers of the world, right? Actually, a mutual customer of ours. Um, who are doing, you know, the, the, the coolest stuff, they're, 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 you know, living in the future, that's kind of for them, but, you know, the traditional companies are, you know, there's going to be all that inertia, right? We actually don't see that. Um, and I think COVID played, in, played an enormous role there in, in kind of accelerating this. Um, you know, Gloat, for example, I mean, we work with, uh, you know, some of the largest, you know, some of the, some of the oldest enterprises in the world. So we work with financial institutions, we work with consumer goods giants, we work with technology companies, we work with you know, kind of young, you know, agile companies and kind of more traditional conventional companies. Um, and there's different, you know, different value and, and different use cases that, you know, different organizations, you know, choose to kind of amplify and emphasize with their talent marketplace. Um, but, you know, we think about, you know, the stakeholder, uh, you know, who's driving this change, you know, because the talent marketplace is something that is touching so many parts of the business and so many stakeholders, employees, managers, uh, HR and leadership, you know, we typically see that it could start with talent management, or it could start with a, you know, development, you know, learning and development lead, it could start with talent acquisition, but it almost in every case becomes a much broader initiative in the business to, you know, transform because people realize that this isn't just about, you know, helping our recruiters recruit more efficiently, or, you know, the, the way we typically think about an HR point solution. This is, this is something that's completely transforming the way that the business works, the way that the business thinks about talent and so on. Um, for example, uh, we actually recently hosted a, a webinar with Patricia Frost, the CHRO of Seagate. Mm -hmm. uh, Seagate is a, is a company that you know, decided to build their talent marketplace really in, in the midst of the pandemic. Um, and we you know, started with, you know, at a reasonable scale and, and you know, quickly, you know, again, in this iterative approach, you know, proving value and decided, you know, in fairly short order to take this to the entire business at Seagate. Uh, and within four months, they were able to, you know, demonstrate $1.4 million of ROI. They created, you know, hundreds of projects, you know, moved, moved hundreds of people around the organization and were able to start and, you know, create this type of, of agility in, in such short order. I mean, they were, they were an incredible uh, company with, with incredible leadership. But we see that in, in all kinds of companies, um, you know, even some of the you know, world's you know, largest global financial institutions where, you know, you think the complexity of, you know, how they think about, you know, different salary bands and, you know, just the bureaucracy and, and yeah, as you mentioned, GDPR and other, other, you know, kind of big, you know, sort of structural challenges to, to doing something like this and being agile, they're finding a way um, and they're finding that, you know, 
again, it's about being flexible. It's about being iterative. Not every organization we work with is going to start with projects and jobs and career paths and succession planning and you know the whole the whole you know um, the whole show. They might say, you know, we want to start with projects and mentorship, mm -hmm. and then they get down the road and they say, let's add full time roles mm -hmm. and let's add you know let's add career pathing, let's add networking, let's let's you know start to build this marketplace and increase the type of opportunities and you know, follow the demand and, and gain momentum. So. Um, hopefully that answers some, some of the layers of, of your question. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, I, 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 absolutely. And it's, it's the case where to your point at the outset, you know, it's going to be different for different companies, different stages, yes. different industries, yes. different sizes and all that, you know, that being said, there's been kind of, uh, a paralysis that I've seen. It's like, I, I, I don't want to do something that seems you know way out there. However, in my view, if you're going to talk about the future of work, if you're going to do visioning as an organization, scenario planning, whatever you want to call it, then there needs to be a means in which to execute against that from a talent perspective. And what I hear you two saying is that you provide means by which to do that. Okay, we're, we're now going to have a talent strategy that's going to facilitate internal development, that's going to go in parallel and complement our recruiting strategy and other engagement strategies strategy, retention strategies, diversity and inclusion strategies. So there is something that's, you know, cohesive there. So that's my hope. And that's what I'm what I'm hearing. But that's my lens. Um, Ian, I'm sure you have thoughts on this. This is something that we've talked about a lot in terms of governance, you know, who's consuming it and, and taking action. What, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, I got I mean, a couple of quick thoughts, like a, a lot of there's a lot of leading practitioners who have Vizier as the enabling backbone. And, and there's a lot of that stuff out in the market, like recent conversation with RJ Milner is available to view. But I was also thinking what, what, about what Brian was saying, which is which is probably the majority of our customers, you know, it's the, the CHRO is the buyer. And what they're trying to do is quickly and cost effectively get the basics covered. Because mm. at its core, Vizier is an enabling technology to distribute a lot of um, commonly accessed information to a lot of people with like a, you know, a quarter or, or less of the effort you know mm. estimations of savings of two or three fte you know going to ryan's um, observation like the, the roi is instant not necessarily in terms of technology costs but definitely in terms of people costs mm. so a lot of our our kind of core buyer set is the the chro who is constrained and and you know, not necessarily expert in analytics knows they want the data but can't afford the kind of Google-esque or Capital One-esque monster team to go and build all that stuff and, and needs to get it going fast. So, you know, the completeness of Vizier service to raw data through to delivered insight, the fact that we've seen every HRS on the planet and can sort of ingest spreadsheet plus, plus uh, HRS and stitch all that together into, you know, a consistent headcount that everybody trusts, like, that's actually the majority of our buyer because then they got the foundation covered. They've got it covered in a repeatable, automated, secure way that then allows them to grow. So, you know, get, there's a lot of really exciting stuff that our leading players are doing. And again, I live in admiration of those folks. They're, they're part of our virtuous cycle. But the majority of our users are, you know, they have a one or two person analytics team, but they're serving 300 managers a consistent headcount on a daily basis. And, and that's that's what Vizier means to them uh, in terms of just enabling, because then they can grow on top of that. I mean, you and I know how this function evolves. Like you, you don't go straight to the moonshot project because that's a it's like, you know, fly or die kind of <laughs> opportunity. You got to build trust, you got to build consistency, you got to build standardization, and you need to make the technology choices that move you forward. So we're increasing that chro who's like there has to be a way for me to just just rent this because i can't afford the people but i can uh get the enabling technology and then our our ideal user is it's it's always been this push pull uh, again we're starting to get evidence on the the like the truly true value and, and it's at that at scale you've mm -hmm. seen a lot of my talk tracks for this year it's mm -hmm. what covid did and what we see in our own usage data is mean that people managers are using the data. Like people became the focus of so many decisions 
and it, it wasn't mm -hmm. fast enough to go ask HR them to come pull the report, bring it back and talk about it. That mm -hmm. needed to be at the second, like at the speed of the decision. Mm -hmm. So th that's what we enabled. That's what we hit up. So we've seen, you know, Vizier unleashed <laughs> across, you know, literally hundreds and hundreds of people people managers and, and that's that's our ideal consumer is the person who owns the people and cares about the decision but properly supported by the people who understand people i mean that this is where you know well why don't you just give it to it and they can build it's like i've seen that happen I've never really enjoyed the result like technically it all works but some of the assumptions are made they don't take they don't appreciate the sentience and choice and sensitivity that comes with people they like you need those two things together so it needs to live in a people domain um but the it, it yeah you need to kind of get it out to people managers to use because that's those are the ones who care yeah no i think it's extremely well said and i just want to emphasize the point that people data is unique as you both well know and not only for security reasons in many cases it's just the interpretation thereof requires some layers of nuance and 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 definition and that's where i have a few more questions uh you know for you too before just we, quickly but and if i can i'll like yeah yeah Glow we're taking us through their technology this morning, like just a workflow and, and, and stuff, because we're, we're looking at how we you know, deepen the connection between the products and the amount of data that's there and the, the structures in it and the complexities of it is enormous. You have somebody who could apply for three assignments. So that's one person with a job doing three possible projects who then has a cluster of skills that will map onto and not map onto some of those assignments. So it's not like, you know, even sales analytics would be simple. Marketing analytics would be simple. Finance is a doddle compared to the richness of, you know, an individual with three sub items, which have clusters associated with them, which all make up a decision about do they or do they not move forward with that? And hmm. there's an element of choice because I can upvote or downvote a particular project I want to get to. So, you know, when people say they're like, oh yeah, people, that's kind of simple. Like, oh no, the data sets are beautifully rich and complex and they unleash some real value. So it cannot be underestimated. Yeah, gosh, I, it's actually a great segue into the question that I, I, I wanted to ask and, and first a call out because what I want to congratulate both of you is using language very purposefully and intentionally. Uh, Brian, you and I talked in the uh, uh, pre-call for this, uh, and you brought out this term uh, liquidity, and you mentioned it earlier. Uh, you also talk about purpose, you talk about capacity. And these are very natural language words that non HR professionals understand. And there's a host of research that shows the value of aligning with one's purpose around building habits around understanding that in COVID, even before COVID, that we all are constrained by time, and there's burnout, and you know, and if I don't understand what this effort is for, what the heck am I doing? So there's now this context that, that's being built. So I just want to you know, give you a chance, Brian and, and Ian, can you speak to the intentional use of language, specifically what capacity means to you, Brian, and this notion of liquidity that complements it? Yeah, ab absolutely. I'd love to uh, sort of expand on that. Um, you know, I think actually, you know, when we thought about, you know, again, creating this, this concept of an internal marketplace for the first time for talent, right, and inside of a company, um, which, which no one had really done before, you know, we, we came into this, you know, world where people were talking about, obviously, people data and skills data and so on. But the way we kind of were thinking about it was, okay, you know, skills data, you know, typically something we think of as tied to, you know, learning, right? And as long as that skill is, you know, exists somewhere on somebody's profile, it means we have it um, and we are future proofed and, you know, we can achieve, you know, any, any goal we need because we have all these skills because they're on everyone's, you know, learning profiles. Uh, and that sort of just misses this, you know, this other dimension, which is capacity, right? Um, you might have, you know, all the skills you need in theory somewhere in the organization, but your people are busy. Your people are, you know, focused on their roles. They have their heads down 
um, or they're you know engaged in other projects and those skills might not be available. So that dimension of, of capacity is really what we looked at as sort of this missing piece to understand, again, how we create this liquidity, right? Because mm -hmm. I can't just say, okay, there's skills over here, bring them over there and bring those over here. There's the human being at the other end of the profile, right? And we need to know what they're working on and you know, we need you know, them to be a stakeholder in that. So you know, in the platform, uh, you know, the employee can actually obviously you know, tell us basically, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm open to opportunities, I'm free to opportunities, I have, you know, time I can stretch myself or, you know, during COVID actually, you know, the case was usually, you know, their business line might've been, you know, extremely impacted, right? So, I mean, we had a business, Unilever, for example, where their food services business for a time almost ground to a halt, right? This was, you know, business that was you know, supplying restaurants and those people, you know, had a lot of, capacity and what Unilever was able to do was 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 understand that and see that and then understand their skills and bring them to areas of the business that were experiencing really high demand right hmm. so this capacity piece is is really important and uh yeah something that you know we've you know built our product to to begin to understand and again you know not not starting with you know this top-down idea of you know what are the titles what are the skills that we you know should have in theory and you know, it, it, it's useful for, for kind of a workforce planning kind of exercise and so on. But when it comes to the work, we need to start with the work and we need to understand the work. And then we need to understand capacity and skills as sort of one intrinsically uh, tied entity in order to be able to create this you know, marketplace liquidity. Well, I, I, I could hug you for saying that. Start with the work. <laughs> because not everyone does. Well, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It, it, no, no, it's, it's, it's a beautiful notion. And, yeah. uh, but it, and then it, uh, it requires understanding the work and how much it, you know, time it takes, the complexities they're in. And I think that's, a, to your earlier point, we have a lot of runway there. We have a lot of ability to better understand the work. And then the choices, is it, you know, the work uh, done by internal people, external people, is it automated, is it, you know, outsourced, you know, wh whatever the case is, and hopefully we're going to, to advance, you know, towards that end. And as I go, um, you know, back over to you, and as we start to, you know, wrap up and get, do have a couple more, you know, questions. Yeah, I want to talk, ask you in, unless you have a comment to tell on what Brian just shared is really about your personal, um, you know, journey to get to this point. I mean, you've been, chopping wood in, in this domain for uh, a few years. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, so, and the experience um, that you and others have, uh, you know, and there's only a handful, frankly, that has the depth and perspective of, of you, you know, where do you think, you know, how did you get to where you are now? And where do you think, you know, we're, we're going? Because obviously you're excited about what you're doing with Vizier and obviously you've partnered with Gloat and there's reasons behind that. So I'm just trying to get a little bit behind the curtain, so to speak, and understand, hey, you know, why is this exciting to you? Yeah, so, so let me give you the, 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 the potted personal journey. It's a 30 second conversation. I describe it as the CFO challenge. Like I started life doing this soft skills work. I saw the material benefit of it. I could never get the CFO to fund it because there was no data. Mm -hmm. So I trained myself in measurement, the application of it, the kind of social science side. Um, and then over 20 years, I've, I've built a benchmarking business, I've contributed a Vizier, uh, talked, trained, educated um, over that time frame. And, and I, I, I firmly believe that 2020 was the tipping point. Like changes, it's a generational change. It's not a mm -hmm. flick of a switch kind of change, it's a generational change. Mm -hmm. um, my excitement is the, the, the efficiency wave is done. Like mm -hmm. we had to get some record keeping stuff out of the way. Mm -hmm. but, but when I see all of the new tech, all of the, I mean, I was struck by what Brian's describing, like, well, why wouldn't you build this yourself? Like, let's just look at that. There's 20 or more great product people in Cyclo. There's how many, who knows how many engineers and they have spent 24, 36 months thinking through the problem and designing a solution for that. Like, mm -hmm. how would you replicate that yourself inside a business? Right. Like, and why would you? I mean, you know, if we go back to the skills thing, there's, there's a story there. So I'm excited because I'm seeing these applications available, the technology at the level, the understanding to use the technology at the level. 
uh, and I'm seeing organizations adopt and use them so that this mission to unleash the person is now actually being supported with real technology that actually solves the problem. And, mm -hmm. and, and it, you know, whilst we may be at the start of that wave, it's the wave is not going back on the beach. The wave is not retreating. It, it you know, I look at what Gloat's done. I look at some of our other partners around so Medallia in terms of listening and how they've made that person centric. Our other partner, Eva, who's looking at burnout and how they've made that person centric. Like all of this tech is totally out of the HR admin world and totally into the help people thrive. Uh, and I'm seeing these organizations successful. I'm seeing them grow. I'm seeing what comes from you binding all that together. And it's like, this is how we should have been doing it for years. So, you know, you know, like it's like anything, Al, when you start to see the real change, um, the growth of the number of posts, the number of organizations that are getting in when they've been hes hesitating before, like it's, we're just in a really good time. Because um, yeah. the, the journey is up from here, basically. I absolutely love what you're sharing. I couldn't agree more. Brian, you, your thoughts on you know, your journey and what Ian just said about where we are and where we're going in the space. Yeah, uh, Ian, what you said, yeah, really, really resonates uh, for, for my story as well. I'm, I'm relatively much newer to the world of HR and HR technology. Um, before I joined Gloat, I was actually working for a venture capital firm as an enterprise technology investor. Um, so I was looking at all kinds of you know, technology coming into the enterprise in HR and, and in you know, many other domains. And I met Gloat uh, in, in, in that seat, in that perspective. Um, and they were a fairly young company at the time. But I saw that you know, as a relatively small company, they were you know, completely transforming the way that some of the biggest companies in the world were, you know, doing business and, you know, touching, you know, the careers of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. And I was sort of mesmerized by, you know, just the, the idea, the scope of the vision, uh, the team and, and the passion that they had for it. Um, so I actually just fell in love with the company. I thought I have to be a part of this. Um, and it, it was one of those things where, you know, just felt like, you know, just one of these, you know, rare opportunities to, you know, get involved in technology, which is you know, something that I've always been passionate about, but do it in a way that's making an impact on people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things, you know, we say, you know, in our, in our employer branding and, you know, Gloat is, Gloat is hiring. So, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, anyone, anyone uh, interested, uh, you know, re reach out, but, you know, we say, you know, come build your career by helping, you know, millions build theirs. Um, and that's, that's what, you know, we all believe that we're doing as a company and it's, you know, what, what our, you know, from CEO down, that's, that's, you know, what we're really passionate about, you know, this opportunity is, you know, using technology and, you know, impacting the way that, you know, people navigate more fulfilling careers and completely changing the way these, you know, huge companies, you know, actually work. So uh, that's what, you know, inspires me. And uh, that's kind of what has fueled my journey into this crazy world of HR technology. Well, I mean, both of you are inspiring me and, and I don't say that tongue in cheek and, and nor do I say it, you know, with, uh, lightly because you know the idea that well the reason I'm in this work is because I got two young kids uh, they're actually 20 and almost 18 now and they're entering the workforce and mm -hmm. I think us three grew it up in what I call the suck it up generation uh, where you're lucky to have a job this is the way it is you just deal with it pay your dues and uh, you know in millennial generation started the transition and now with the digital generation is you know the capacity for to deal with bs is a lot less you know the propensity to move is a lot higher you know so organizations need to do this to attract top talent and retain top talent and power and enable them so for you all to have thought through the problem uh, and really help devise solutions that are sustainable that are scalable um, I, I think it's a beautiful thing and yeah, it's not only going to help organizations like i said it's going to help individuals as well so keep up the great work um, as we start to close uh you know brian how can people learn more about you personally and and gloat 
connect with me on, on, on LinkedIn. Um, that's, that's always a great place to start and Globe, you know, visit us at globe.com. Uh, there's lots of great resources there. You know, learn more about the talent marketplace and, and stories from our customers, uh, and, you know, what, it, what it's all about. So. Outstanding. And Ian, same question. Yeah. How can they learn about you and more about Vizier? Yeah. So to follow me personally, LinkedIn is the space. Uh, I run a debate every Thursday. Uh, people ask questions, usually get some really hot, contested and interesting educational uh, content rolling there. And then vizier.com, um, you know, our website is a great place. We we do speak, we're great, you know, firm fans of Pafau and all the work that, that is comes through that. So keep connected to Pafau and you'll hear from us. Um, and then, yeah, I think that's probably the, the website and LinkedIn are the key ways to get educated. Well, gentlemen, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. And uh, hope to see you in person before too long. This year might be the year, if not you know, uh, early next year. So, all right. Thanks again. Take care. Thanks, Al. Thanks, Al. Thanks for joining the People Data for Good podcast with Al Adamson. To find other podcasts, videos, upcoming events, and to join the People Data for Good movement, please visit us at pafau.net.